welcome back to Conscious Caregiving with LNL, where we're tackling the tough conversations. The topic this month is love, kindness, and seniors. Welcome everyone to Conscious Caregiving with LNL. I am your co-host, Lance A. Slatton. I'm also the host of All Home Care Matters and the co-host of the Caregiver's Journal with Denise Brown. Thank all of you for being here with us today to talk about an important issue and something that doesn't often get talked about, and that is love, kindness, and seniors. I would like to also welcome my esteemed co-host, Ms. Lori LeBay, the founder of Alzheimer's Speaks, the co-host of Conscious Caregiving with LNL, and the co-founder of Dementia Map. Thank you for being here today, Lori. Well, I am excited to be here. We have an amazing panel that I think is going to be really uplifting for everyone. So um, listen in and pass it along. Absolutely. I would like to take a moment, though, and have each of you introduce yourselves. We'll start with Stephen. Hi there, my name is Stephen Post, Stephen G. Post, and I live in Stony Brook on the North Shore of Long Island. I'm a founding professor of the Center for Medical Humanities, Compassionate Care, and Bioethics at the Stony Brook University School of Medicine, and I've been working in the, in the area of uh, deeply forgetful people for about 40 years, believe it or not, and... Uh, beginning with my grandmother as a, as a fairly young guy. Uh, and, um, and I run the Institute for Research on Unlimited Love. It's incredible. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today, Stephen. Next, I'd like to go to Loretta. Hi, everyone. My name is Loretta Woodward Beeney. I am an inspirational speaker and author and a certified Lego serious play facilitator. And for 16 years, I was my mom, Doris's caregiver and she had dementia. So we tried to live every day with joy and we did that well. Wonderful. Thank you for being here, Loretta. Next, we'll go to Thank Kim. You. You're welcome. Next, we'll go to you, Kim. Hi, everybody. My name is Kim Hamer and I'm author of 100 Acts of Love, A Girlfriend's Guide to Loving Your Friend Through Cancer or Loss. I help people know what to say, what not to say, and how to show up for those who are in dealing with crisis, including taking care of someone with dementia. Wonderful. And thank you for being with us, Kim. Uh, next, we'll go to Cindy. Hi, I'm Cindy Luzinski. I'm the founder and executive director of Dementia Together, a nonprofit organization in Northern Colorado. And we're all about cultivating joy and building stronger connections for people living with dementia, their care partners, and our communities. Well, thank you for being here. Each of you bring some important value to, to the field of care, caregiving, and just, just society as a whole, right? We all can use more love and kindness, but I think it especially rings true for our seniors who some may be alone, isolated, or living in facilities, any number of things. And so we want to really highlight the significance of that today. And I want to start off with you, Stephen. You wrote the book, Why Good Things Happen to Good People, How to Live a Longer, Happier, Healthier Life by the Simple Act of Giving. Explain the title and why you feel that way. Well, it's scientifically accurate, but I do feel <laughs> that way. The bottom line is that we are designed as creatures to be kind. Kindness is not as complicated as empathy and compassion. It's just a matter of acknowledging people, of being generous with them, giving them a little attention here and there. Kindness is what makes the world work. And human beings evolved in such a way that groups have an advantage evolutionarily uh, when they have lots of kindness and giving and helping beha behavior uh, mixed in. Uh, some people have the wrong impression that human nature is all selfish. It's not at all that way, and Darwin didn't believe that. So science and neuroscience uh, has defined this very carefully now. Uh, we know a lot about the pathways of the brain that are associated with kindness and that turn off the pathways that are associated with bitterness and hostility and rumination the things that actually, if they're left turned on in an extended way, are very poor for health because they mm. contribute to stress. And so when you do good to another human being, you also, you cannot help but do good to yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Stephen, for you, you know, you were saying how it was evolutionary. Where was your evolution? When did you become interested or started down this road? You said 40 years 
you know, you've been involved. What was the genesis of your story? Well, with regard to the deeply forgetful people, uh, I use that expression instead of dementia, because I think of dementia as a fairly negative term. It's like the word retard. We don't call people retarded. We call them differently abled. Uh, and so dementia, to me, uh, invites negative metaphors like husk, shell, empty. And you do hear that uh, in various uh, settings. And even politically, I might add, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I like to speak about deeply forgetful people because I have my moments, if I can confess. <laughs> and I guess we all do. And, you know, of course, some of our moments are more significant than others, but we all struggle with with memory. And it's a term that brings us into greater continuity. I think dementia is like them versus us in a way for a lot of people, but deeply forgetful. You know, I have my men, I, I have to ask medical students in the garage, do you know where I parked my car? And then one day I asked one of them, do you know if I drove to work today? <laughs> and that was a little more serious. But anyway, since I was a youngster, my grandmother um, uh, uh, had what they called senile dementia at the time. Mm -hmm. And I would just go to the nursing home uh, and uh, do assisted oral feeding with her uh, at the end of the day. And um, I realized that I could connect with her at very profound levels. And sometimes like, you have to be open to surprises. And in, in Dignity for Deeply Forgetful People, I define hope as being open to surprises, those moments of unexpected, surprising lucidity, mm -hmm. where somebody who seems to have been totally gone is somehow there. Uh, and, and and they're even vocal, and they can respond to music, as you all are aware, and 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 art, and and uh, uh, the smell of an apple pie that reminds them of their childhood. So uh, I've always believed that hope in this context is is about caregivers finding meaning in um, these moments of unexpected lucidity. And I had that with my grandmother. So I would be sitting there, you know, with bran and juice and things. And very occasionally she would just look at me and I knew that she was really identifying me for as her grandson. And she would say something like, Stevie, pass the potatoes or whatever, <laughs> you know. And and so, you know, and, and we just did a big national survey with the Gallup organization, which is not published yet, but it's coming out on American caregivers. It's the first national survey of its type. And, and it's focused on the meaning of these experiences of unexpected lucidity. And that they, you know, basically, no, grandma is, is not gone. Grandma is still there. She may be a little opaque right now. She may be a little bit in the recesses. But if you use language correctly, and there's a lot, of, lot to that, uh, uh, you, you know, don't ask uh, someone, what would you like for breakfast? Because you're putting so much pressure on them. But if you say, would you like oatmeal or post toasties, you'll bring them out, you know? And uh, so basically, uh, you know, for me, uh, it's always been a matter of uh, countering the cultural stereotype that these individuals are not fully human, fully there, uh, they, again, they may be opaque, they may be difficult sometimes to find, but you have to notice. And what we found in this study is that the vast, vast majority of primary caregivers have had these experiences of unexpected lucidity. And no one had known this before, but in almost 80% of them, it gave them a sense of purpose, an elevated sense of meaning, that in fact, their caring, which can be very draining uh, and and needs to be supported and I did some of that as a as a youngster too and I and I've done a lot of it since then uh, in respite and so forth but uh, for me um, just knowing that that somebody is not gone but they're there is a really important thing sure. I was on a phone call with a wonderful uh, African American Baptist pastor whose sister he he's from Detroit he was my mentor in, in Cleveland um, she was uh, in the last throes of Alzheimer's in Detroit, and he called me on the phone, and he uh, and he asked me, "Is is my sister still here?" And I said, "Well, Pastor, what do you think?" And he said, "Well, 
I dare not say she's gone. And then he said, in fact, I have these moments where I think she's actually ahead of me. She's going down to the Amtrak station and she's got one foot on that blessed train for glory. Mm -hmm. If I told you his name, you would know him, but I can't do that. Um, so uh, that's the whole secret uh, to me is seeing seeing uh, the continuity of personal identity, even when everybody tells you because they're hypercognitive. That's a a word that I, I coined in, at Case Western, hypercognitive. They just think about value, human value in terms of cognition and cognitive dexterity. But actually, that's how you got to uh, the, the the nationalist socialists in Germany. I mean, these these individuals were were uh, the deeply forgetful were life unworthy of life. They were useless eaters. And in the T four program, seventy thousand of them in nineteen thirty nine were taken out of asylums, and they were brought out into the cold, and they were left to freeze in ice water in snow. Uh, and then they would be brought back into the asylums. This took place over a year and a half. And they would be warmed up at different rates, at different temperatures, and so forth, sometimes in water, sometimes in hot air. Of course, they were all gone by that time. But this was what was going on. Why? They had one thing going against them. They were deeply forgetful. And, mm -hmm. and you know, that is still uh, something that uh, causes us to other, as the word goes, to other mm -hmm. A lot of people, uh, so that's that's how I got started, and I I never dropped that that interest in in bringing people into the human community fully. Yeah. Well, thank you, and that's a fascinating story, Stephen. I wanted to ask if you could also just uh, briefly give us some examples of how to be loving and kind to seniors, and also why it's important not just for them as recipients, but us as the givers. Well, it absolutely is salvation for givers. You know, um, it's so easy to spin down into a kind of negative vortex of despair and frustration. And that's understandable because caregiving is a, is a big job. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, if you can stick with kindness, you can have a much easier time of it. Uh, people with dementia, people who are deeply forgetful, respond, as, as, I, as I know everyone here is well aware, uh, they respond to kindness and warmth. Uh, and it's a beautiful thing. I was out in, I was out in Mount Vernon, Ohio. I'm, I'm in Ohio and in lots of ways. And uh, uh, I went with Dr. Joe Foley, a famous old neurologist now deceased, to uh, a, um, a hospital for the aged, and there was a wing of it devoted to people with uh, Down syndrome who had gotten into their 50s, so they were also struggling with probable Alzheimer's disease. That's called the duly diagnosed. And their behavior was quite difficult, but there were these wonderful Hindu nurses aides who had a little community out there in the middle of Ohio, <laughs> and, and, and they were taking care of these folks. And Joe and I, uh, Joe was the co-founder of the Alzheimer's Association nationally, incidentally. So Joe and I just looked at them and we observed them for a while. And then we asked several of them to come out to a pizza restaurant. There's only one restaurant in that part of Ohio. <laughs> so we took these wonderful Hindus to a pizza place. And um, and we asked them, why, why are you so conscientious? Why are you so diligent? Why are you so tender in your hearts? And they said, and this is a word everybody who listens to this will know, namaste, mm -hmm. which in the Hindu tradition means I honor the divine in you. Yeah. And so that's never gone. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm just a mainstream old Episcopalian, but you know, there's a passage I like, nothing can separate us from the love of God, mm -hmm. not even deep forgetfulness. That's fascinating. When, um, when you look at the evolution of you know deeply forgetful people slash dementia where it's at today just as a side where are you happy with the progress you've seen over the years i'm not happy with the cultural progress i think it's still an uphill battle you know everybody who becomes a caregiver has to become an advocate i remember now we're going back 20 years and some of, i bet loretta and kim may remember this the alzheimer's association had a uh, 
had a meeting in Washington, D.C., uh, and it was for advocating uh, with congressmen and senators that they could give more money uh, uh, to care, for caregivers, for respite care. That's how I broke into this field in my Cleveland days. Mm -hmm. I just did respite care one day a week while I was at Case. And uh, and and so we, we, we went up in the evening with candles to their offices. And they said, you know, we really like your cause, but we can't support it. And the reason is because if we supported caregivers for the deeply forgetful, people didn't, I didn't use that word quite as much back then, but now I use it all the time. Uh, uh, we wouldn't have, uh, we wouldn't be able to do it for other groups. So, so we, we can't just do this for you. That was their answer. Even though we had studies, we had done studies, Peter Whitehouse, myself and others had actually done investigations showing that if you just give caregivers three hours a week, on one day, doing respite, with respite, you know, it's just not a lot of time. It's not a lot of effort. It's pretty brief. But if you just go in there and you're kind and you let them get off to the movies or get to the supermarket or just take a walk in the park, actually their their um, rate of unhappiness, there is a slight increased depression rate in, in caregivers taken globally. It goes right down to baseline. So that's what we should be doing. We should we should be providing respite. You know, talk about. I got to say something about justice. You know, our justice system is based on the idea of individualism and independence. And so we ignore the fact. Every one of us in this society, we ignore the fact that we are vulnerable, frail human creatures, and that we are not on our own. We do depend on others. Tremendously. And at certain times in our lives, when we come into the world, when we get seriously ill, uh, my good friend Brooke Ellison, who was on my faculty here, who had quadriplegia, just died the other day and was all over the papers. But she was 11 years old. She was crossing the street. She got hit by a car. She did graduate from Harvard valedictorian. And Christopher Reeve did a movie about her. But, you know, Brooke was here day in and day out with her mom. She was completely dependent on her mom. That's actually the human condition. The human condition is that we are vulnerable, frail creatures. And as soon as we forget the fact that we depend on others, we're out of business. And, it, and, and so what happens in a society like ours is that, you know, we'll, pro we'll provide funding for all kinds of crazy things. Don't get me started. But you know what we don't do? We, <laughs> we, we, we give to people who are caregivers, we give them, even at best, we give them scraps. I hope that's not an unkind word, but we give them scraps and leftovers. And it ought to be reversed. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're the ones who ought to be at the center of our consciousness. That would be conscious caring, in my view. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Stephen. I want to um, turn to Lori now. And uh, Lori? I'm going to make one one more plug for, for Stephen, because you also wrote the book, Why Good Things Happen to Good People, How to Live Longer, Happier, and a Healthier Life by the Simple Act of Giving. And I just think that that is so overlooked so much of the time. And what we're talking about today, um, you know, you're going to hear us talk about Alzheimer's, but it, it applies to everything. You know, this really is, it's our seniors, it's our kids, it's our partners, it's it's how we should live our lives and what we've gotten away from. And it's really, I think, much easier to do than, than, we, uh, than we think yeah. and, and what we get back from it. Um, but Loretta, I want to go to you because you are such a powerhouse and um, <laughs> talk about inspirational speaker. She's just off the charts. She just got back from London. I mean, the woman just is, is on the go. Um, she, she's our energizer bunny here. I want to ask you on, um, you know, how, uh, maybe I should put it this way, uh, that I don't think that we fully understand about love and kindness when it comes to play. And I know that you incorporate play every single day and everything you do with everybody you meet. Yeah. Um, you know, so how the heck do you do that? Because I think you're so serious and we're so busy and we just get so sidetracked that we forget the really important things. So 
tell us about this play aspect and how the heck do you keep incorporating it and have made a business of it? <laughs> I know, right? Who thought this would be, you know, my life? So, ah, I tell you, well, you know, play was always really important in our family. So when I was five, my mother got me a box of Lego bricks and not the ones with the instructions to build a plane, train, automobile, you know, kind of thing. She, today it's called a classic box. It's just a big mashup of colors and shapes and all that. And my mother wanted us to use our imagination. Simple as that. And so we started playing with the Lego at, you know, like I said, five-ish. What was so interesting was we use Lego for everything, good and bad. So if, you know, um, we had a, a great day at school, I got good grades, yay, we built with Lego. If, you know, some boy didn't like me, you know, we built with Lego. She had a bad day at work, we built with Lego. It was just a Lego thing, like, wow. And it just, what I didn't realize was that it was sticking. And so one of the things that my mother always taught us was A, being kind. When I gave her eulogy in 2022, I talked about the five lessons I learned from my mom. And the primary one was, you know, being kind to others. And um, a subset of that was when you find something that works, you share it with other people. So it turns out that Lego thing, you know, just kind of took off. And what I realized was I'm a been a huge Lego fan my whole life. And in 2009 ish, I sort of discovered this thing that Lego was working on called Lego Serious Play. It, it's such an odd title or something that's so a whole lot of fun. And I wanted to take the course it was supposed to it was designed by lego as a business tool to help organizations communicate and listen more effectively and uh, they asked some uh, former employees of lego or asked some employees to become former employees and then they uh, reached out to some academicians throughout the uk to um, help them put together this, this tool that would help people be more successful and what they found was that um <laughs> Their mantra sort of was that um, Lego Serious Play, as it is today, ensures that everyone is included and that all voices are heard. I'm like, oh, ding, ding, ding. That meant people with dementia. It didn't say all voices except people with dementia. And so what finally sort of precipitated my rush to become certified was in 2014, so year almost eight of her disease, that's the year she forgot who I was. And so since um, the course was originally like more pricey <laughs> and I was willing to part with, but when she forgot who I was, you know, we did the, okay, let's sign up thing. And I knew it would, you know, bring about some help. So anyway, the principles of it really shortly um, is it has four parts. You give folks a task and they use their Lego bricks to build their response to the task. Then everybody shares the story of what they built. And then um, we have a, you know, after the sharing, you know, we sort of do a little reflection. So those are the, the four parts, task, build, share, reflect. Okay. So I just started to use that with my mom and I was stunned at, even though she was going you know, deeper into her dementia, she could always come up with a story. And even if she forgot the rest of the story halfway through, he would say, but that was fun. And then leave it at that. So we were kind of cool. But here's what I think was most significant about that. One of the things that people really struggle when they're caring for somebody with dementia is not only the repetition, but how they, you know, lose their words and they get so frustrated when they can't figure out the words. So, you know, you're, you're trying to say water bottle here and she, was, she would say, you know, that thing, that thing, that thing right there. And then, so I had to remember, don't finish her sentences. So when she got really frustrated, I would give her a couple of Lego bricks and she would just simply snap them together. And then she would say, water bottle. Hmm. So if I just waited long enough, she would come up with the word herself, typically. And so I learned from that, A, 
and you know, you can see I talk really fast. So I'm always like, okay, hurry up with that word. So I just paced myself as well. And so even when she couldn't come up with exactly, exp especially when it came to feelings. So when we got in the car after her diagnosis, and she's pretty hysterical, who would not be? And I had Lego bricks in my car, yes. <laughs> I had a little one of those little desks on my, and it was tethered to my dashboard that she could build on. That's how we kept her calm during DC traffic. And so I said, how are you feeling? And when we get in the car, she's just hysterical. And she, I could see she was struggling with her words. And I asked her to build how she was feeling. And so she took her little Lego minifigure and little Lego people. And she popped the head off that thing and she held it up. And she said, I feel like in a few years, I'm going to lose my head. I put that on social media and people lost their minds. You know, how profound of her to be able to articulate that, right? And so, sort of the story, the, the sort of program was, uh, you know, it just came to life. And so I, following her instructions, uh, if you find something that works, you do not keep it to yourself, you share it with other people. So I started to contact, once I got my certification in 2014, I started calling adult day programs in the DC area and memory care facilities and started going and building with them. So that moment of lucidity, Stephen, it was powerful because she would always come back. And now I'm just gonna be totally honest, that blank stare that comes with this disease drove me absolutely crazy, couldn't deal with it. But you know how to get rid of the blank stare? Lego, woohoo! And so the minute I got the, the Lego out, the blank stare would go away and everybody came to see it. The New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, everybody came to see because she was snapped right back and people thought I made that up. So when the New York Times came, we, you know, she had been just doing a puzzle and she wasn't connecting with it at all. And the man's looking at me like, I thought you said she was alert. So you could see he's getting really aggravated. And so after he'd been in my house an hour interviewing me, he says, well, let me see the Lego bricks. He feels like this is a total waste of his time. And so I get the Legos out. I pour them on the desk. She grabs some. She snaps them together. And then she sees the man. Who has been in my house for an hour? She's like, oh, hello. Like he just walked in. And he says, oh, my God. How does she do that? I have no idea. Now, Stephen, I wish I had known you back then because people took today asked me, do you wish you had done some research into why that worked? And I'm going to stick by my original answer, which was no, because I promised my mother the day she was diagnosed that we would have joy every day. And we pretty much did that with the Lego bricks. I didn't want to spend time writing down at 210, she came out and told this story that she remembered from 1939. That wasn't important to me. I just wanted to play with my mom. And so that's what it was. And it's so amazing to me that years after she forgot who I was, she still remembered Lego. So I would come over and she would say, she lived in the group home about five minutes from me. And so she would say, hi, you're here. And then she was like, where's the Lego? <laughs> so I, I'm so unimportant. But as long as I had the, the Lego, we, you know, we were good. And so it was just an amazing thing. And I think what is, if there's anything hard about this job, so now I travel all around the country and yes, I was in London doing that. Uh, if you don't know, Lego headquarters is in Denmark. And so um, I've gotten some additional certifications since then. I've been using it to build resilience with caregivers. And that's my latest certification in that, which I got this past October uh, in Denmark. And so what has become amazing about this tool is that you can help other families have that moment when they talk again, when people haven't talked in years. And so Sunrise Senior Living, for example, in Silver Spring, Maryland, had me come and build their favorite family vacation. OK, who don't want to build that? A couple of people I was told they only say a, a word or two. You think it'll work for them? Oh, let's just see what happens. And a family was building a cruise, uh, uh, their favorite vacation, which was a cruise they had gone on 15 years prior. And they built this little cruise ship. And all of a sudden, the woman who was 93, and I was told she didn't talk hardly at all. She starts moving around in her chair. So I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe we need to take a break. She needs to use the restroom. No, she did not need to use the restroom. The issue was she was remembering line dancing on the cruise ship. And then she's doing this and the midnight buffet and people are crying and screaming and running and high-fiving. I'm not sure what is going on. So it turns out she hadn't talked in years. And so she starts talking about the line dancing and stuff. And so the, the niece who was there with her, with her husband, 
the niece is hysterical. She says, auntie, you remember the cruise? And she says, of course I remember it. And she says, well, auntie, you never talk about it. And auntie says, you never asked me. So see, like Stephen <laughs> said, they still in there. It is our job to go in there and get them. And if we choose not to do that, that's on us. And so every day we did that. And that was the whole, so now I go play all around the world. So, you know, uh, TSA has named me the Lego lady. Their term, not mine, because I fly with probably 10, 15,000 bricks with, in different little, you know, kits. And what is so amazing is Lego makes a heart. And so I use one or both of these hearts in each of my kits. Um, Lego makes a kit for Lego Serious Play, but I make my own because I like the brighter colors and the deeper they get, the more color becomes important. So this is everybody's favorite piece, the heart, because caregivers need a lot of love and they give a lot of love and the same for people with dementia. So people usually will build on top of it. This is me holding my mom's hand. And, and so there are a lot of tears. This is a very emotional process in a lot of cases, but it's just really the stories that we uncover. That is, I could write a book just on some of the stories that have come out from the now hundreds and hundreds of people who have worked with this. I even quit my job during COVID. I was a 40 year security professional. My last gig was at the uh, Department of Homeland uh, Security and Immigration. And I quit my job during COVID because so many distraught caregivers were calling me every day once COVID hit and no adult day progress. Loretta, what am I supposed to do with my dad and grandpa all day? And so I spent five, six hours on the phone and finally realized um, I need to quit my job. So I did that. So here I am. Well, it's, it's fantastic. You know, I love the way you utilize them because the building is the engagement piece. It is. So often seniors are overlooked if they've got Alzheimer's or someone's got cancer or another chronic illness, yeah. trust or, you know, whatever they're fighting. And then you invite them in to share. And, you know, you've already built this comfortable community for them yeah. with with people like them doing the same thing where nothing yep. is wrong. And then you get to reflect and, and share some more. And I yeah. think we have lost, I hate to say it, but in a lot of ways we've, we've lost the ability or people think they've lost the ability or to have the time to take, um, to do those things, to slow yeah. down and really communicate. It's it's just a task list. We're shoving off <laughs> back and forth to people all the time these days. Right. And I think the other thing that I love about, um, you know, if my mom lived with dementia for 30 years, I always say what's good for dementia is good for all of the world. There's not one yes. thing that you can do for these people that isn't going to have a positive effect on anybody else in your life at any age, at any stage. And to me, that is absolutely critical because, you know, from, from Stephen and Loretta, and I'm sure we'll hear this from Cindy and Kim as well, it's about, you know, kindness and love is about honoring somebody, you know, slowing down, stepping into their space, honoring mm -hmm. them, and, and trusting the relationship and not having preconceived ideas of outcomes, you know, mm -hmm. just going from the heart and doing doing what is right and not letting your brain override and derail you sometimes. Now, the other thing that you talk about is listening um, and how that is critical in terms of showing love and kindness. Can you explain um, how that affects seniors just to be listened to, to be heard? Oh, yeah. I think stories are so important. You'll find that uh, some of the most successful caregivers, uh, be it family or professional, are those that who, you know, learn all the life stories. And that's, you know, what I love most about traveling around the country and, you know, meeting all these people because they they um, still want to share. They want to feel heard of all of the things. Some of these people are so accomplished. When I was in uh Texas a few weeks ago, there was a person there who had worked on both the Apollo and the space shuttle things. And I mean, he was like, he had one of the last tasks before they walk out and get on. He built this thing and everybody's ooing and aahing. And some of the people that had worked there for years never knew that about him until he started, you know, building. So I think the more we listen, the more we can even understand some of the behavioral challenges. A lot of times it's because they're not feeling hurt. You know, they just want to have their dignity preserved and have somebody still care about what they think and feel. And the better listeners we are, the more we're able to 
um, share that. Because I think when we cut people off and, you know, get our words in and, you know, they just shut down a lot of times because they don't think, well, we're not listening anyway. So I, I like to just sit. And even if I have to count, you know, to a hundred, you know, before they can get something out, I think we honor them by, you know, being interested in what was important to them and what is still important to them. So I think listening is one of the keys to um, being a fantastic caregiver. Well, I, I would agree with you on that. And I think I hear from so many seniors um, that they feel invisible. They don't feel heard. You know, they don't, people don't look at them. You know, it's, they say, I feel like people are scared of me. You know, right. that, and it's like, I'm not an atomic bomb, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm really okay. And then it seems like when you're in crisis, now all of a sudden you're missing all of the things that you took for granted day in mm -hmm. and day out. Yeah. And people step into the listening a little bit more, though patients, you know, can kind of wear and tear on you too with schedules and things. But right. it, it is such a gift. And I really wish we would teach that more in school, the importance of not coming up with your answer and your response, yes. but really being present and being <laughs> whole and giving somebody their time on stage so that they can, you know, illuminate and shine with yeah. whatever it is. I mean, it's just a, a, a beautiful, beautiful thing. Well, um, I, I also want to just give a plug because you do have your fidgets and puzzles, and you also have a coloring book that you've done. All of these things are kindness, you know, tools mm -hmm. that people can use to interact and engage. And it's not like they have to do it alone. Right. You do it with them. And again, uh, kindness is intergenerational. And mm -hmm. so we should be leading by example, I think, in all areas of our life with that. So yes. um, thank you for your insights, Lance. I'm going to pass it back to you again. Thank you, Lori. I want to go to Kim next. Kim Hamer, you are the author of uh, 100 Acts of Love, A Girlfriend's Guide to Loving Your Friend Through Cancer or Loss. I think you could write a couple of books and just add caregiver after that, parent with dementia after that. Mm -hmm. But I think the acts of love really resonate regardless of what the situation could be, right? Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, why do you think people struggle with what to do or to say when they, you know, encounter either a, a girlfriend, a friend, or even just a family member dealing with an illness, disease, or just a bad day? Why do they have a hard time knowing what to do or what to say? Well, I think, first of all, we're not taught. You know, and we forget this is it isn't even about being taught in school. Our parents remember 50 years ago, people whispered cancer. It was like she has cancer. Yeah. You know, no one talked about when I was growing up. I didn't hear about dementia. Um, so we don't we don't know these this all this information is new to us and we don't know how to talk about it. It's not like my mother taught me. I think the other thing um, that that Stephen talked about is it shows us our vulnerability. And that is something that we are terrified of. You know, we're all going to die, but we all act like we're not. Um, you know, I don't know if I'm going to get up from this conversation and live to the end of the day. I have no idea. But to think about that is terrifying. And so when someone we know is dealing with something that's random, cancer, I can't, I mean, we all know what can help cause dementia, but we don't know what causes dementia. And so the idea that I might be, I might have dementia or that I might be taking care of someone with dementia, that's, that just shows our vulnerability in our face. And particularly as Americans, we don't do with that very well. So I think that's why we just kind of clam up and shut down and I'm going to look the other way. I'm going to pretend I don't see them or just kind of go, oh my gosh, hi. And I'm not even going to ask how are they because I don't even want to go there. So I think it's it's really a cultural thing that we're just not used to it and we don't, and we feel deep. And on the other side of it, we feel deeply inadequate. And so when we feel like we don't know what to do or what to say, our response is usually not to go into it or to move into it. Our response is to back away from it. Right. Yeah. You you shy away from what you don't know. Right. And if you're not comfortable, and I'm, I'm going to be a little maybe biased here. I think men are probably especially deficient in this area most times. Um, I would say Stephen and I are the exception. Right, Stephen? Um, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> Why don't you share, though, Kim, 
some some ideas or suggestions of what people can say to a friend, a coworker, or a boss who is dealing with an unexpected crisis, illness, or situation? What are some things they could say that they're going to be in a safe zone and not they won't have that fear of maybe overstepping or insulting or offending? Yeah. So I actually want to start with what not to say, because I think that that flips it on its head. So one of the things everyone says is, if you need anything, let me know. Right. And it feels like you're being really helpful and it feels like you're offering this thing and that you and in the moment when we say this to people, we really mean it. But it's not helpful for three specific reasons. One, what is anything? If you're dealing with, if you're a caregiver and you're, 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 you're person, you're, you're offering support to a caregiver of dementia, anything is too big. Did you mean you'd come and give me respite for an hour? Or did you mean that you'd drop off a bottle of wine at the door? Did you mean that you'd take a, that you come to read to my mother who's with dementia? Or did you mean that you'd be like happy to call and leave a joke on, on my, you know, voice mis- machine? So what is anything? It's way too big a word. And then that word puts the pressure on the person who needs the help to figure out what they need. And even if you're dealing with a caregiver who has been doing this for four, five, six years, what they need is not always at the front of their mind. They're not even sure what they need. And then the last reason it's not helpful is now you've put the pressure on them. They're feeling vulnerable. They're feeling ignored. They're feeling like you really didn't mean it to reach out to you to ask for the one thing that 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 you may not even be really will, willing to do in the moment you felt like you'd willing to do. But maybe my need is, you know, caviar from Russia. And and, and now I'm going to ask you, do you mind? like hopping on a plane and going to Russia and getting me this caviar because it's real. My mother really, really, really loves it. Mm -hmm. So, so it puts the pressure, it inadvertently puts the pressure on the person you're trying to help um, to figure out all that stuff. And when they're under pressure, they're not going to ask. And I think this particularly is also goes for, I mean, some people think it's like in the moment in the crisis, but I think particularly it goes for people who have been in crisis who are are caregiving for long periods of time because they're so used to hearing that and they're so used to people not following up. So they're, they just kind of, the minute that word, let me know if you need anything comes out of their mouth, they're shut down. They're not listening. They, They know you, they feel like you really didn't mean it. So, I start with that because the other side is the first thing, as I always say, acknowledge what's going on. And I think, um, Scott, you talked about, I mean, Stephen, you talked about, Loretta, you talked about it. People feel ignored. And it is, it is, I'm in HR and I am always amazed at how often I go in to help with an employee relations issue and they just want to be heard. And at the end of the conversation, they don't want me to take any action. They don't want me to do anything. They don't want me to fix anything. They just want to be heard. And I think that that, you know, Loretta, what you talked about is so true. People just want to be heard and they want to be seen. And when you take a moment to say, holy cow, that sucks, right? (laughs) When you can just acknowledge that is a that's a really tough life you're in right now. We you can say things like that and look at them and not follow it with anything. That reduces the stress so much. So at work, you know, I am so sorry you just moved your mother into an assisted living. That must be really hard. End of sentence. So seeing them is really important. The second thing I often say is be really specific on what you can do. We all have helping superpowers. And the thing with our helping superpowers is we take them for granted. So it's usually something that we enjoy doing by ourselves. So for me, I really like cleaning a kitchen. You know, I like finding, I like ordering that one thing in the supermarket that they don't have and finding it. So that's my superpower. My superpower is I'll come in and clean your kitchen in a second. Like give, just, you know, let me know when I can come and I'll do it. My other superpower is is being able to find that one item that they can't find anywhere in any grocery stores. And I will meet that truck at 5 a.m. and get that thing off that truck. Do not ask me to cook you a meal. 
not my superpower. Terrified the whole thing of timing it and what do they want? And do they want, do they want salt on their green beans? Do they not want salt on their green beans? I really like apple cider vinegar on my collard greens that they, you know, that just stresses me out. So we all have these superpowers and, and, and if we can make, if we just kind of touch in with what those are, maybe you're a good listener. Maybe you're a great baker. Maybe you know how to work an Excel spreadsheet like nobody's business, right? Maybe you, maybe you do V lookups or pivot tables and you're really great. And so offering that kind of support, particularly at work, is really helpful. So be really specific about the kind of support that you can offer. And that you may think it's really stupid, but trust me, if you offer it and you offer it more than once, when that person needs it, they're going to feel comfortable calling you mm -hmm. and asking for it. So, you know, what we what we forget is that we're trying to make their lives easier. That's why we reach out to help. That's why we say things. That's why we're concerned. We feel awful. We want to make their lives easier. And one of the best ways we can do it is be really specific on how they can help and how and how what we can do can help them. And they may not call you for a year. They may not call you for months, but in that moment, you keep offering and they need that thing. You have just given them the biggest gift because now they know exactly what you're willing to do and they feel really comfortable asking you because you've offered more than once and they will call you and ask and you come in and you do that one thing and you get out the door and you think, oh, I want to do more, but I promise that one thing that you did was good enough. Yeah, I know. Just uh, going back to, you know, you and I uh, had an interview last year on All Home Care Matters. And, you know, I really encourage people to listen to it because you give some great advice and we really go deeper into the book. But one of the things, and it still stands out to this day, was you said one of the most meaningful acts of love that you received was, I think it was your husband's friend or a neighbor went and got the oil changed and got you gas yeah. in the car. And you're like, that little simple gesture just made the biggest difference. And another suggestion you give is, you know, for the caregivers, when people do offer to help or say, and because people will, you know, definitely do this, I'll, can I help you with anything? Have a list already made up and say, yes, here, pick something off the list, you know, and yes. it just makes it simple. And, you know, they're, they're feeling helpful as well. But what are some of the common feelings that you feel like many supporters feel when trying to help? Why, why do you think that matters? So, um, I think, well, I just want to back up. So I came into this field because my husband had cancer twice and then died. And I ha we happened to be, we didn't know we were in these communities until he got cancer. And people rushed in to support and some people knew exactly what to do and how to help and majority of them didn't. And then after he died, sort of the same thing happened. And I just realized that there was this sort of space where caregivers or where people really want to help. They want to help and they just don't know how. And there's this kind of like I see it's a like cliff and there's this, what you know, the caregivers on one side or the person dealing with whatever it is on one side and all these people are crowded on this other side and there's no bridge. And so I wrote the book as a bridge to be able to support. I think supporters, I think what's really hard for caregivers is I remember when my husband first was diagnosed, people kept showing up at my door with meals and very helpful, had three young children, needed the meals. And I called my sister and I said, this needs to stop. I can't, I can't do it anymore. And she said, what are you talking about? And I said, it's just, it's just too much. And after we dive, dove in deeper into the conversation, I was overwhelmed by the support and I was overwhelmed because when everyone shows up, it is, here's a lasagna. I love you. Here's some toys for the kids. I care about you. Here's some, here's, let me change the oil in your car. You matter. And it's very overwhelming as a person who's receiving that help to receive that help because what they're saying to you, which is not something that we hear often, is you matter. And I care about you and I love you, and I want to make your life a little bit easier. And as a receiver, it's really hard to take that in. It is so much easier to shut the door and say, thank you, I've got it. Thank you so much. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. So I think there's that piece. And I think supporters, um, What ha and I is that what you're talking about, Lance? Are you talking about the caregiver point of view, or are you talking about the person who's trying well, to support? Just the, how the, the feelings that a lot of supporters feel when they're trying to help. 
you know, yeah. that, that, and you know, why that matters as well. So supporters feel, I think one of the things that we forget is we affect people's lives just by saying hello, just by being who we are. We show up, we make a difference and we walk away. Right. And a supporter is, is trying to tell you, thank you. So supporters often want to say, thank you for showing up. Thank you for being in my life. You're someone who matters. You're someone who I, I really care about. And it comes from that place, or it also comes from a place of paying it forward, where they were cared for by somebody else. Someone did something kind to them, and they want to pay it forward to you. I think some of the common feelings that supporters feel is that feeling of, I don't know what to say or what to do. So I just, I just, I, I, you know, there's this sort of sense of panic and a sense of being afraid of embarrassing themselves, being afraid of saying the wrong thing, being afraid of making it worse. Um, it's, I, I will, I hear this a lot in the widow community that someone will come say something to a widow and say, I'm so sorry. And the widow will start to cry. And the person who said it will say, oh my gosh, I didn't mean to make you cry. I didn't mean to make you remember, right? <laughs> as if, as if the yeah. widow is going to forget that their person has died or that their child has died, right? Or that a caregiver is going to forget that their mother is dealing with dementia, right? So so we we come from this place of sort of tippy-toeing and feeling unsure. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's normal for supporters to feel that. But what I really want to encourage supporters to do is to have the courage to just take an action. Because that action is so, even if you get it wrong, even if you get it wrong, the fact that you took an action will talk, will, will show the supporter, it will show the person that you care about that you really care, that you really matter, right? That you're trying. And I think that's the thing. Don't get stuck in the, I don't know what to do, so I'm not going to do anything. Because when you do that, that is one of the most hurtful and most painful things you can do to a caregiver or to someone who's dealing with a really difficult time. Right. I want to... Um kind of wrap up here real quickly and just ask you a couple more quick questions. You know, we're talking about, you know, our communities, our neighbors, our, even our family, extended family, our social circle, but a lot of people still have to continue to work while they're dealing with these crises, whether it's a yeah. parent, a spouse, a child. So you have your work family too, which that can get a little awkward and uncomfortable and you have HR regulations and things. How can we better offer support for caregivers who are in the workplace if it is a coworker? Well, I think there's two things. I mean, I think leaders need to have, I mean, if it's, I'm going to go with three different levels. Yeah. HR needs to do more education. Um, they need to have a backup plan. They need to have some type of plan helping leaders and coworkers manage this. And if a coworker is coming forward and saying, my just put, my mother just got diagnosed with dementia. We've been told we've got to make all these rules. I don't know what I'm doing. They are, providing that information in the workplace and the workplace can help support with that. And I'm not talking about putting in different programs and making sure everything's fair. So whenever someone in the company has, you know, has a situation that it's, it is really simply educating your leaders on what to say and how to show up. A leader can say to someone, if they're having, if this person seems off that day, Hey, I'm noticing that your work is not up to par. Let's have a conversation about what we need to take off your plate for the minute, for the time being, right? And like I said, even just having that conversation, that person may say, you know what? I'm actually good. They may feel more seen and connected that they can put that, that time and energy back into doing their job, or they may need the break. So I think it's really, again, it is about being a leader and an organization that is understanding that that the person who's showing up at work, whether you want them to bring their whole selves to work or not, they are bringing their whole selves to work. And that you need to teach leaders and coworkers how to kind of support that person. When you, there's some, some great studies been done recently that you can combine empathy and productivity and that increases your revenue. And I'm just going to get to like, you know, business here. If you really want to build a business that is going to last for the long term, you combine those two things, empathy and productivity, and you are going to be in good stead. So I think, again, it's um, 
it's taking the time to slow down and to do simple things that that allow the whole organization, the whole team to gather around and support an employee dealing with this difficulty because that in in the long term helps not just the employee, it helps the the whole team function as human beings and it helps the organization do better. Wonderful. Hope that was that's yeah. great, Kim. Great. And uh, appreciate you, you know, adding your voice and, you know, expertise to this issue. Um, last qu- thing for you, though, if you had one message that you wanted listeners and viewers mm-hmm. to really get from this mm-hmm. show today, what's the one big lesson you want them all to know? That you matter. That's great. And I think that we forget as we go in our day to day lives, interacting with people, that how much we matter to other people right. and you showing up really makes a difference. It'll make a difference for them, but it'll also make a difference for you. Wonderful. Well, Kim, thank you so much. We appreciate you being here and all the work you're doing. Um, Lori, I'd like to go back to you. Oh my gosh. Um, Kim, what great information. You had me in tears almost a couple of times. <laughs> I was holding back with your passion coming through. Um, I love that you wrapped up with you matter you know, one of the things I wanted to add was I think a lot of times people who want to care and want to support um, are so afraid of the emotions that they're feeling that they just take a detour because, it, you know, they could go, they could get a meal, they could do all that. But, oh, my gosh, I don't know if I could see this person because I'm going to break down. And and I think a lot of times they're not even thinking what that impact's going to have on the person they want to care for. They just personally can't deal with those emotions. And I think as a society, we have got to change um, what we talk about and what matters so that we can do this more freely because we all have these emotions. You know, none of us are different from anyone else. And, you know, the more we can work together and support and not judge that someone's, you know, crying or they're angry, someone, you know, is sick or has passed or whatever their situation is, those are normal emotions to process, you know, or they're, maybe they're in denial. Um, I, I think that's very, very key. And I also really appreciated when you said about work, you know, what can we take off your plate? Because most people that I talk to say, I'm afraid to let anybody know because I don't want to lose my job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, when you approach saying, you know, let's talk, those, those first words will probably stop their hearts (laughs) thinking, Oh no, (laughs) you know, what's coming. Um, And so approaching that, especially when staff is short, but again, it really, when people work together and you have that teamwork, I'm, I'm 64. When I was younger, Everything was done as a team, but now everything seems to be overly micromanaged and siloed. And we've broken our teams, it seems like, in so many aspects. And then we wonder why they don't work together. Well, a lot of companies don't allow them to anymore because they're under this this micro or um, magnifying glass. And and it's it's created a lot of fear. And so I love that humanistic approach. I love that you talked about the empathy and the productivity. You know, it matters and, and it affects outcomes. Um, so so thank you for that. Um, Cindy, I want to go to you. Um, Cindy and I go way back. And <laughs> she is one of the most compassionate people that I know on so many levels, not just with her work with dementia, but her family, her friends, a stranger on the street, it does not make any difference with this woman. Um, kindness just flows out of her. She's just kind of this ray of sunshine. And like she's kind of, I can see her face going, oh, come on, stop. You know? I don't know what I'm going to say here. <laughs> but, but it's true. She, she makes such a difference. And one of the things uh, that she stands by is saying, you know, choose to be kind instead of right. And, you know, where did that come from and and how did you get to that, Cindy? Well, I have had the privilege of teaching what's called the speckle method in um, when I teach care partners, professionals, people in the community. So the speckle method comes from the UK. It's rooted in person-centered care, but it's more than just another person-centered care model. 
uh, because we do talk about kindness is what we all need, but sometimes kind people still ask questions that somebody with dementia can't answer. Sometimes kind people will still contradict meaning well. And sometimes kind people will speak too much and not listen to the expert who's living with dementia. So we teach the speckle method here. And I think that's uh, kind of what got me thinking about kindness in general and how kindness um, almost fosters other virtues like humility and compassion. And when we work with care partners, we talk about if if we define dementia, and this is how we teach it, and it's a very simplified approach, but if we just uh, understand dementia for the purposes of managing the condition as a simple disability, it can be positively managed if we just consider dementia as uh, the failure to store recent facts randomly, intermittently, and with increasing frequency, these facts fail to store, but the feelings store the same way as usual. When we just treat dementia that way, it changes how we interact. And it helps explain what you were talking about when you have that unexpected lucidity. Well, the feelings will store for all of us, but only randomly will facts store for people with dementia. So when we are expecting that, we definitely can celebrate and savor those moments when those actual facts are storing, but even when they're not, like Loretta said, you know, like her mom, whether she could identify her name and her face, she, those feelings stored of, man, this is this is the Lego woman who brings me joy. And that's the kind of stuff where we talk about how do we create that joy? How do we operate on the feelings level? And so even, um, Stephen, I appreciated what you said about deeply forgetful people and how kind of the stigma around the word dementia is out there for sure. And when, when I... Talk, use the word dementia, I talk about it as from the two Latin words meaning separated from the mind. So when I talk to my friends experiencing it, it's like, that's right. It feels like my mind isn't doing what I want it to do. And there's nothing in that word that implies being separated from the heart, separated from the soul. And so our whole approach using the speckle method and everything we do is like, how do we connect on that heart and soul level, because you are right, it is still there. And the main message that we give to people living with dementia is your value doesn't lie in your ability to recall the recent past. You are not just what you remember. Your value lies in really who who you were created to be. And like, you know, Stephen, you said nothing will separate us from the love of God. And we talk about that, that you are who you were created to be by your creator, or whoever your, your God is. And we definitely um, follow that. And so we, we talk about dementia as being kind of a lesson in kindness and grace in all directions. And Kim sort of alluded to this too, where we need to show grace to the person who's experiencing dementia. We need to show grace to people who are trying and might not get it right, but anything short of perfection isn't failure. I mean, the failure is not trying. <laughs> and we also then need to show grace to the people that are afraid to try because they don't know better. Um, we had a couple, um, Rodney and Ginny, who went to a hockey game recently. We have a local hockey team and they gave us tickets. Um, and Ginny, with living with dementia, had trouble figuring out the seat and how to sit down. And people behind her started laughing, thinking she was drunk and couldn't figure out how to sit down. And all Rodney had to do was say, oh yeah, we're we're living with Alzheimer's. And it's kind of like what you talked about, like people want to do better. They want to help. And so to give out those little cards that say, here's how you can help. We have a bunch of them that we're like, give them out like candy to anybody you know. But as soon as they found out that Ginny had Alzheimer's, they became Rodney and Ginny's best friends. And they were looking out for her. And, and if she started to walk away, they'd, you know, tap his shoulder. Rodney, <laughs> you know, pay attention. <laughs> and, and he's a very good care partner. Um, so I do think people want to help. They want to be kind. And we have to show them grace when they are at least trying and may, may not get it. Right. And then I, I think working with care partners, the hardest direction to show grace is toward ourselves. 
because there's so many times we don't get it right as care partners. There's so many times we don't get it right in other areas of our lives. And so that those voices of condemnation, I think, are our worst enemies. And so really a big question is, you know, is our kindness big enough and is our compassion deep enough that it will even extend to ourselves? And so when I get to, you know, teach about compassion fatigue for care partners, we talk about, you know, how do you balance the, maybe not, it's more integrating the experiences of grief and joy at the same time. You don't have to get through the grief. You have to just integrate it and live with it and realize that grief is part of the journey. And so is joy. And helping people with that helps them, I think, cope with the whole idea of compassion fatigue um, and also just real practical steps we talk about are not just uh, like using a gratitude journal. That's great. And we do need to absolutely pay attention to what we have to be grateful for every day. But there's more benefit even when you can identify what did I do today that made a situation better? What was my part in it? Because for professionals, that gives them a reason to come back to work the next day. If they can identify one situation that was um, better because they showed kindness, maybe even if they didn't feel like it, but they did it and look at the results. So trying to um, talk about practical strategies with care partners, I think can help them um, and just help them know that, you know, like it is normal. This is a hard journey, but boy, one act of kindness can flip around a bad day. And all of us together, um, I think that's, really where the beauty in dementia comes. I mean, I'm all about, you know, get over the tragedy narrative and start talking about the joy and the contentment and how we can create that and how we get do-overs sometimes with dementia when we don't quite get it right. But I do think the tragedy in dementia is when people do back away and nobody's around to help them learn strategies to know how to come alongside folks on the journey. Interesting. I, I don't even know if I answered your question. I just started to bla bla babble. <laughs> well, it's just, it's such a broad um, area to cover. I mean, we could, we could do a conference on this for, you know, a week and we still wouldn't cover everything in all the different ways. You know, um, one of the things that's coming out to me, you know, as we've been talking is a lot of times our conversation is wrapped around um, being kind to someone we know. But it's not limited to someone we know by any stretch of the imagination. We've all been in the cashier line where someone's struggling with money um, or maybe they lost their credit card or, you know, they can't pay or they've got kids that are screaming and yelling. <laughs> and you can tell they just want to drag them out and leave the cart and, and go away. And what can we do in those types of situations as well yeah. to a perfect stranger or I know I've been in the, the you know, caribou line, getting my coffee and they'll go, oh, it's been paid for, you know, from the person ahead. And it just automatically makes my day good. And so then I buy the next guy's, you know, coffee. I read an article the other day that was really interesting, or it was a story actually on Facebook. And they talked about this man went into this restaurant and he saw um, these posters in the back and it said, you know, you could take a a free coffee and donut or a free meal. And she couldn't figure out what, what that was all about. And the staff said, well, just have your meal and sit down and watch. And so what she watched over time was that people would come in and donate and they would ring up a cup of coffee and a donut and they'd put it on the board. So it was already paid for and they would buy a meal and it would be put up on the board. And it said something like, um, if, if you're in need of a meal, you know, grab a tag. And it was just there. And it was like, how cool. I mean, I think so many people would participate in stuff like that if, if the initiative was started by organizations, you know, to do that. And, and uh, I mean, I think of even companies and stuff back in the day, you know, if you were sick, you know, and there was really an illness, they made sure you got a card from your department or your company and everybody signed it. I don't see that so much anymore. Mm -hmm. A really simple thing, but really mattered and built a team and said you cared. 
Um, so I, I think that, you know, well, I've seen Cindy in action, you know, through her conferences and just so many other other things that she does. And the energy that she builds is just contagious in terms of everybody is giving and everyone is engaged and everyone is happy and everyone is just there to help and to be better. And it's just, it's, it's an incredible ripple effect. And I think people forget about that ripple effect. And what that matters, you know, even Kim, when you were saying at work, you know, if you said that to an employee, they might have one other good friend that they've shared their story with. And they'll go, do you know what, you know what they did? And and then that gets out and then it changes how the company's looked at, right. you know, yeah. I mean, it's just, and none of these things that we're talking about are hard to do. Many of them don't even have to cost us any money at all. Um Cindy, I wanted to ask you about, do you think the world has changed in terms of how much kindness is given out and what is received these days? Well, I think our world is changing, <laughs> yes. Um, I think the research is so interesting about being kind and how it really benefits the person giving it, it benefits the person receiving it, and it benefits people who watch it, which that is amazing to me that that is the ripple effect that you're that you're talking about sometimes i think you know how trust is somewhat decreasing in our culture and sometimes people are you know when you're nice to them it's like well wait what does she want mm -hmm. versus us being able to say well, well no this is just this is what we do <laughs> like why are you asking <laughs> So I, I just think that we just, even if we're questioned in our motives, or maybe we're in it, we're just not trying to be kind, we're, we're trying to get something out of it. It's like, be kind anyway. We're not responsible for people doubting our motives. We just can always choose to be kind. And like you said, Lori, it doesn't take much. I want I will give you a quick example of Rodney, our, sa our same guy I was talking about with Ginny. He was having a bad day with her. He didn't get much sleep. He has to do two loads of laundry in the morning. He, he has um, insurance called. He had to fight with them, figure out what to feed Ginny for breakfast. She knocks over a vase of flowers. He gets it cleaned up. Then he knocks over the vase of flowers. <laughs> and then he's trying to figure out what to do for lunch. And he, you know, it was just like this bad day all along. They go take a walk. Um, and he has Jenny go to the mailbox and, and he said, and she took the mail out, looked at it, put it back in <laughs> and he just smiled and took the mail out. And then what he took out of the mailbox was just a letter from, from us. And we do, we try to practice, um, what we call unreasonable hospitality. There's a book called unreasonable hospitality, and we've kind of taken it to how do we show kindness in our organization? And when you talk about how it doesn't have to be expensive, at our memory cafes, we take pictures of the couples and then have the, those pictures for them. So a $1 frame, that picture, and a little note mailed to Rodney that says, you know, we're honored that you allowed us to walk this journey with you. You model what love looks like even when it's hard. Mail it out. No big deal. He gets it that day. <laughs> and... And that's where you don't realize how an act of kindness can stop that negative cycle. And so he wrote us a note and he said, um, how you ruined my, I hate my world day and feeling sorry for myself. <laughs> I find a beautiful picture of Jenny and me and I'm even smiling. And so this is, this is kind of what it looked like. Um, but that's all we did. And it's so simple but it really can make a difference in people's lives. And I will say like my staff show unreasonable hospitality among us. I was having a rough day. And so one of them drops off a card to my house with sushi and chocolate and <laughs> those kinds of things that are just personal and you wouldn't think are that big of a deal, but boy, they really are. And you're right, Lori, they just have ripple effects. Yeah, it, it is amazing. And it can, you know, a bad day can be stopped when mm -hmm. you back to, you know, what Kim said, you matter. Yep. And those little, you know, I mean, you go to the dollar store and get cards for 50 cents yep. you know, or you can pay $6 up to you. You know, yeah. what, what you want to do. I go for the dollar store cards. <laughs> um, but, but sometimes, you know, people are so used to bills in the mail and things like that. 
And that can, you know, especially for our seniors, I mean, that's how they used to communicate. And that's kind of gone by the wayside now. And to get that, get that card, I, I go in, you know, a lot of seniors homes and stuff. And those cards, they don't get put away, you mm -hmm. know, and they're held on to. And, and you know, it's so, something they can physically touch and feel. It's not a one time I read it. And, you know, I'm putting it in the trash now. For most yeah. of them. I mean, it's it's really, really meaningful. So this has just, um, just been an amazing conversation. Lance, I'm going to throw it over to you. And um, I'm sure you've got a couple of questions after hearing what everyone's been saying. Yeah, I just want to first thank everybody for their time today and for talking about this often not to discuss topic of love, kindness, and seniors. Um, I wanted to go back to Stephen briefly and kind of ask him, Stephen, after being a part of this discussion, is there any takeaways that you have or ideas that maybe you didn't have prior to the conversation? Oh, lots. I mean, this is such a wonderful group. I'm just humbled by it. And, you know, um, Loretta, is, so what I took from you is the importance of sim symbolic life. You no know, philosophers say we live in symbols and symbols live in us. Now, mm -hmm. someone their 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 linear rationality, the linear rationality gets them from point A to point B and yeah. carry out tasks A and C. That may be pretty gone, but they can still connect with a yeah. Lego, or they can still connect mm -hmm. with an article of clothing that that captures their identity. Yes. You know, w whether they were an artist or a musician. So symbolic rationality never goes. Mm -hmm. And I found, I think you found too, it sounds like, you know, you go deep into the progression of deep forgetfulness and people can be still reached symbolically. If you mm -hmm. use symbols thoughtfully and carefully, you can make a lot of uh, gains with that. Yes. So that's what I picked up from Loretta, who's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you are. And and from Kim, I mean, you know, I I I I thought I really liked, you know, I've been I've been studying how when you give kindly, I mean, that's the emphasis, you know, it's not just the benefits of giving. That's not really quite true. You have mm -hmm. to give with kindness, with a heart of kindness, and it doesn't have to be a lot. But if kindness is involved, you're going to benefit but also, I think that people who watch that, I think it's a beautiful point, you know, that see that palpably expressed, mm -hmm. you know, they also are uplifted. And I think that's so, so important in, in, in our lives. And, and Cindy, you know, you were, you were just unbelievable. You know, I, I, I mean, I wish I, I wish I was your next door neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> But beautiful work, and and I'm I'm so inspired by all of you. You know, my dad said you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. That's true. And I don't yeah. think that yeah. was original to him, but he said it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give yeah. him credit. Yeah. Well, and he and you know he was kind of the mastermind behind you getting into this space with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it seems like everyone here has had um, a special moment. You know. With Loretta, with your mom, Kim, with your husband, uh, Stephen, with your grandma, um, me with my mom, you know, Lance with your dad. I mean, it's it makes you look at life differently, and you have you choices. You can you can struggle through it and walk away and forget about it, or you can learn the lessons that that tough, you know, piece of life taught you, and then get back to you know what Loretta said. You learn it, it works, you share it. Yeah. Stepping mm -hmm. up. And it doesn't, especially nowadays on social media, it's really easy to share. And we need to encourage more of that, not share. So, oh, I've got numbers, you know, and I have so many likes. And not for those mm -hmm. reasons, but share because you care right. and you want to make someone's life better. Yeah. And, you know, if we can... You know, if we can march out today and get the world to step into that, I mean, big things can happen quickly um, mm -hmm. and you feel everybody matters. Um, Loretta, how about you? I loved Lance's question about what did what did you draw out of this today? 
Ah, uh, I thought that was great too. I'm gonna be saying deeply forgetful people <laughs> forever now. <laughs> then Kim said that too. Let's let's all write that down. So yeah, oh man, I thought that was fascinating. And you know, I so Kim and I have so much in common. My daughter's name is Kim, but you know, I too am a widow, and, and it's interesting. Um, and what was scary about my husband dying was that. He did everything for my mother. I was still working. He was a retired DC cop. So he would, you know, take my mom to the doctor. I would meet them there and do the doctor's appointment. I would run back to work. They would go to the mall and go all these places. And so it was so amazing trying to, you know, so, but as Kim said, when he died, you know, my church support group who has their own support group. So we were in New York when he died. And so, you know, by the time I got back to DC, they had made this whole committee for me. But they asked me to write down everything Tim did for my mother, and each one of them took a thing. Wow! And so I did. And and Kim, I kind of flipped that when I'm working with caregivers to say, um, you know, as, about asking for help. You know, the same thing you said. Not like if you need anything. You know, I tell caregivers ask specifically what you need and want. Can you take dad to the barbershop on Tuesday at two? That's a yes or no question. And so, you know, that whole, oh, let me know if you need anything. And then when you don't hear anything, they say, oh, she, Kim must be doing good. She hadn't called. But it's the same. So so I do it in reverse, but I was fascinated by how close, you know, that was. And Cindy, I send the cards. Still got a whole stack over here. What, you know, when people send me something, I have it in my little joy folder, I call it. So when I, I have a stack too that I mail out if somebody you know made my day or something like that. And that's a lot of fun. So when I get a card, I send the card. And so I, I think I really, I love the picture frame. Um, I did. And I try to do that. If, if family members can't come to the Lego event, I take pictures or my GoPro camera and I send it to, you know, the family members who couldn't come. And they say, my dad built that. Yes. Maybe you should build some things with him sometime. Oh, I didn't know he could do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so just get, yes. And you just get my, so I, I thought this was fabulous because I think, you know, regardless of what our own experiences are, you can always learn from each other. So this has been absolutely fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Kim, how about you? Was there anything you took away from the group? Um, hope. I just have to say, listening to everyone share about what they're doing and how they're making an impact. Um, I want to go work at, I want to do the Lego series thing now. And, um, you know, <laughs> Stephen, I actually grew up in Westport, which is oh. across from where you are, yeah. sort of, right? Oh my God. And I want to come out and like, I want to follow you around for a day and just sure. learn what you're doing. And, Cindy, I think you and I are very much along this exact same, um, you know, line. So I think I feel just hopeful and that yeah. feels really good. And I hope that people are listening, feel hopeful because I think, you know, we're all doing our own thing and we're not in the spotlight and we're not getting the front page of the New York times, but I have to, I have to remind myself that that, you know, there are people behind the scenes who are doing things every single day that are making people's mm -hmm. lives better. Mm -hmm. um, and and I need to trust in those people to, to to do their thing and to do it well, and I will do my thing and do it well. And so I yeah. just feel very hopeful. Thank you. Right, Cindy, you. how about you? Yeah, that's, that's so good. I, it doesn't matter if people are seeing what we're doing. I think we mm -hmm. just, we know, and our lives are richer as a result. So yeah. I, I listen to all of you and I just think, well, there's just no downside to <laughs> being kind and loving <laughs> other people. <laughs> so yeah. we just can love one another, be kind to one another, do a lot of one anothering and our world yeah. will be better. I, I agree. And, you know, kindness is not limited by age, mm -hmm. you know, by status, by culture, by neighborhood. You know, it can be done anywhere, anytime by anybody. And it can be received anytime, mm -hmm. anywhere by anyone too. And it's it's one of the simplest things in life. And yet it's sad that it's gotten so overlooked in this fast paced mm -hmm. world that we live in. And so the more we talk about it, the more we give examples of different ways to do that, um, you know, that ripple, you know, will just keep growing and really turn into this huge big wave that you know crushes through society and says this is the way we need to live you right. know we are a tribe um that's the bottom line we are we are one and mm -hmm. um it, we all matter no matter what situation we're going through but our, our seniors 
I think in particular are sometimes really overlooked Mm -hmm. and, you know, they don't have to be ill to be overlooked. They don't have to have dementia. They don't have to, you know, um, be receiving home care or whatever, you know, they can be out in the community and still not have communication Mm -hmm. with people. I, I talked with, I can't remember who it was the other day. I talked to someone and they said they met a stranger that was having a tough day and they, they sat down and talked to him and they found out and this, this man left his house every single day, but he had not talked to a soul in a week. Wow. And you think about that, to walk around in the world and feel not seen or heard. Wow. You know, just to say hi to somebody is an act of kindness. Yes. To give mm-hmm. eye contact is an act of kindness. It's important. It's important, people. Yeah. Um, I, I just, I took so much away from each and every one of you. And like Kim, I just feel so full of hope. And I want to, I just want to have individual conversations with, with each of you or have a conference on kindness and just share this yeah. and just, you know, get the whiteboards out and start writing down all the different ways people can be kind, because it's not something we consciously think about and we need to. Each of us has felt down and out, and it would be nice to have someone go, gosh, you're doing a good job, or um, I'm sorry you're having a hard day, you know, I I know you like this, or let's go to a movie, or go for a walk, or whatever it is, play Legos, doesn't make any difference, I'll take you to church, how about the grocery store, but Mm -hmm. just to know that you are validated, you are seen, and you haven't been forgotten. Yeah. uh, for for every individual, but I think especially for our seniors. So, yeah. Lance, how about you? What what did you take away from today? That it doesn't cost anything to be kind. Mm-hmm. Ah. Yep. Well, why don't you go ahead and wrap up our show? I think unless anybody has any any other comments that they would like to make, Stephen, it looks like you're well, late. Well, I would just like to echo what everyone said, but Lori in particular, you know. Um, I mean, I'm in a medical school and, and part of our job is to teach medical students the techniques of empathy and mm-hmm. the techniques of compassion and active mm-hmm. helping. And, you know, on the one hand, it's just kind of a given, but there's a lot of training and you have to learn how to reflect back. Did I get you right? And so forth. You know, the the, the, the routine. But kindness is just kindness. <laughs> you know, yeah. just just acknowledge somebody. Just hold the door for them. Just ask them, how's the kids? It's that simple. That's all I can say. Mm-hmm. Very true. I, I do have one thing to say. I think that we forget sometimes that it takes courage. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it, it is really simple to be kind, but it also takes courage. It takes a moment yeah. for us to take a risk, to reach out first, to not know how this person yeah. is going to respond. So I think... I, I would like us to see, I would like us to be all a little bit braver. Yeah. Great point. I think that's such a good point, especially in that a culture is. where trust is declining. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. It does take that moment of courage to say, well, I'm going to do it regardless of whether they trust yeah. that I have good intentions or not. Yeah. That's a good point. Well, awesome. Yeah. It's interesting. And I think I might have shared this story on one of our shows before, but I'll share it again that shows the importance of not giving up on somebody and reaching out. Um, I was caring for my dad with um, brain cancer, my mom with dementia. I had girlfriends that wanted me to go to coffee every single week. And I just didn't have time. And it was really actually for me, it was an irritant. Like I, I can't take this call. I really don't even have the seconds to take the call. That's how I was feeling. Just so overwhelmed with everything else that was going on. And one day they called when I was having a really bad day. And I had left my folks' apartment and, and things were just, you know, n- not falling in line the way I wanted them to. And they called and said, you know, we're, we're meeting for coffee, Laura. And I remember kind of snapping back and said, okay, I'll come. I- I'll come for 10 minutes. Like I was the queen and I'm going to give you my time <laughs> out the red carpet. Here I come. And my whole intent was to get them off my back. Mm -hmm. When I said yes, it was to get them off my back because I couldn't receive the kindness. 
And I got there and I stayed two hours and we laughed and we cried. I'm going to get emotional right now thinking about it. But they didn't give up on me. And I went every week after that. And I I was so empty. Mm -hmm. And I got full from being in the presence. And that's what kindness can do. It is. (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) But that's the reality mm-hmm. of kindness, you know? Yeah. People at different levels, and it's received in different ways, depending on what's on their plate. So right. that's a really good point, Kim, you know, that you that you made. Yeah. So thank you. So, Lance, yeah, I'll really let you wrap up now. All right. Well, I'll just, uh, you know, echo that. It was a, a, a great panel, a great discussion. Hopefully it will lead to more discussions on this issue and raise more awareness to the value of you know, simple acts of kindness or a hundred acts of love for Kim's book. Um, but we want to thank all of you today for joining us at Conscious Caregiving with LNL, where we're tackling the tough conversations. And we'll look forward to seeing you guys again in the future. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank, thank you all. You. It's a pleasure thank to invite everybody. Thank you. Thank you for joining us here at Conscious Caregiving with LNL, where we're tackling the tough conversations. We look forward to seeing you next month.